ba ba da da yum bum. It's now time for other ships and fortifications in the equitable Washington Treaty series. And I am your historian for this to ask, Dr. Alice Clark. <laughs> oh, sorry, can resist. The more I've done of this series, the more I have started to think through exactly why and what happened. And the more I get the idea that people were going for the maximum that was possible. And the, the classic example of this is what we're going to be talking about in terms of the fortifications and in terms of the other ships. Because there were so many things which weren't possible. And so didn't happen. They just didn't happen. And that makes things kind of interesting when you think about it. You sort of go, well, hang on. Surely if they were being fair, it should have happened. Nope. They're not being fair. They're going for the best they can get. And this is what creates the treaty it does. Because... If the treaty had been done in an equitable fashion, in a sensible fashion, to produce a long-lasting treaty, in a almost a Keynesian fashion, as the Keynes had the famous advice on the Versailles Treaty and the issues that would create, although, let's be honest, World War II is not down to the, is, as I've argued many times, is not so much down to the Treaty of Versailles as I think to the treaties of Washington and London. I think the naval treaties have far more of an impact, especially in making it a world war. I think Versailles in the end of World War One could well have led to the way World War One ended, could have well have led to a war in Europe at some point. But it didn't have to be a world war. It did not have to be a world war. I think Japan was going to be imperial, and you were probably going to have a confrontation at some point. But there is a managed Japan where the confrontation could be, risk could be minimized, if not eradicated, and certainly the likelihood of them pairing up with Germany could be greatly reduced by making it less worth their while. And there is the, we're going to squeeze Japan as hard as we can, as if they are one of the losing powers of World War One, rather than having fought on our side. That's the problem with the Washington Treaty. In many respects, Japan is treated as if they were one of the losers, not one of the winners. And they were, that's what they thought they were. They thought they'd fought in the, world, in the war longer than America had. Why were they being treated like that? They'd done independent operations. They cleared the Germans out of the Far East. Yes, the British had come along, but not much. And they'd fought in the Mediterranean. They'd done all sorts of operations. No, they hadn't sent a fleet to the a squadron to their grand fleet, but they'd offered, just hadn't been needed. And honestly, the American one is argue whether it was needed or not. It was nice to have them. No one's going to turn down extra battleships, but really it's more about American status that their, their battleships are sent than the actual grand fleet actually needing the ships. Especially the American ships, which, as we all know, when they turned up, the U.S. Navy knew exactly how, how what the issues they had thanks to Congress's funding terms. They didn't have the accuracy of fire, uh, the, the, the shooting practice, or all the things that necessary in maneuvering, etc. The experience needed because Congress had kept that such a tight hold on the training budget. They built the ships, but they hadn't allowed them to learn how to use the ships. The U.S. Navy had these uh, this thing of these. Fairly decent ships, okay, not exactly the fastest in the world, but fairly decent ships. Very good technology. Very good personnel in terms of their ideas, in terms of their, their personality, their commitment to the course. But they hadn't been had the budget to mesh that all together into a viable unit. This is why you always have to worry whenever someone says, oh yeah, we'll just cut the training budget. That's the scariest thing you can cut. The thing you should really never cut. Because there is no point having good people with good equipment and good ideas if they don't know how to do it, they don't actually train properly. And by that, I mean actual proper 
exercises, the big fleet problems they do in the interwar years, the big exercises of Britain does, that is the kind of training you need to be doing on a regular basis. You need to be in a scenario where you're thinking and fighting. Or as well, not how to put it. Let your wars be bloody drills and your drills bloodless bores. Or rather, battles bloody drills and your, dr uh, your drills bloodless battles. That's the best preparation. So, here is the series. I know I've done a quick advertisement of this, but I'm going to go through it again. So, today is other ships and fortifications from the Washington Treaty. Tomorrow will be a UAD informed discussion where I will show off a cruiser which I have made with my ideas of what I would have done under the Washington Treaty. So if I'd been Britain, what cruiser would I have built? And I might even go through the, the American and the Japanese options as well. Overall, and then the 4th of June is overall equitable treaty. What it would look like. And also my discussion of the various ideas you sent me forward as for aircraft carrier versions of the Admiral class and the G3s. Some, quite cute, some very cool drawings have come through. And then we start on London, uh, London treaties on the 5th of June. Capital ships, 5th. Aircraft carriers, 6th. 7th, Pensacola class. Starting of the US Cruiser series. 8th of June. Well, that's going to be a special one. That's cruisers. Again, London Treaty. And then Destroyers, 9th of June. 10th of June, another UAD. Uh, possibly the capital ships, possibly the cruisers, possibly the destroyers of what I would do under my equitable London Treaty. Sloops and other ships on the 11th. Fortifications on the 12th. What was the impact of the treaty on them? There's a lot, there's nothing really put in there about the fortifications, and that's a problem. But it's from the other perspective. And the overall equitable treaty, the 13th of June. Hope you're going to enjoy it. And the ratio debate. I'm trying to start off all these videos now with discussing the ratio debate, just so you know where I'm coming from. I didn't do it for the capital ships. I deleted it because, frankly, it was taking me over time. And then there were complaints. Which are sensible, but honestly, I don't know what else was I would have deleted to retain in and keep it to roughly that time. This is the trouble. I tried to make them, the long patrols not massively long. I, I try to keep them 75 minutes to 90 minutes. If I could get them less, down to an hour, I'm very happy. This one is probably going to be 75 minutes. So the original proposal was a standard flat RN5, USN5, IJN3, Marine Nationale 1.75, Regia Marina 1.75. Okay? That's it. That doesn't really work out for various reasons. I can't think why. And... You have to remember the IGN wanted a 7-10 ratio with the US Navy and the Royal Navy because it felt that if it had a 7-10 ratio, it would have enough ships to feel secure. It wouldn't win. It wasn't. This is the interesting thing. At no point did they think they'd win a war starting off with a 7-10 ratio. They understood the sheer amount of infrastructure those two powers had and could bring to bear in terms of construction. But... They felt it would be it would make it a actual uh, an actual war rather than a potential for a quick steamroller. That was what they were looking for: potential of a quick steamroller. Uh, does it prevent the potential of a quick steamroller? But intelligence told the Americans the lowest they would let, uh, accept is a five to three ratio or a ten to six ratio. Now, we can think that through, but let's be honest, 
what does this what's the practical working out of this well it means that for every five battleships the iogen gets free when it had been it would have been the case that for every 10 they'd have got seven so if again you've been linked to i don't know it, it limited to 15 15 for some reason instead of going for 20 what would it have worked out as well, Japan could, in theory, have had ten and a half ships worth of tonnage for their capital ships, which would have been three hundred and sixty-seven and a half thousand tons on the five hundred twenty-five thousand ton ratio. But when I say this. That's a big debate to get into. And tonnage ratios were not this easy because this is one set of tonnage and mainly it occurs to the capital ships and the aircraft carriers. And why are we not talking about a whole treaty? Why are we talking about a treaty across the two here? Because the ratios break down and are not enforced. No total tonnage limits are put in place for anything below a capital ship or aircraft carrier. There is no tonnage limit implemented below capital ships and aircraft carriers. Yes, you can't build a vessel more than 10,000 tons, but you can build as many of them as you like. Now, you can argue that is quite equitable, because that means everyone can build to their own desire. It also means, realistically, anyone building cruisers which weigh less than 10,000 tons is an idiot. Because you can build as many as you like, so you might as well build them to the maximum size. So here are the articles which affect ships other than carriers and capital ships. We have Article 11. No vessel of war exceeding 10,000 tons stand displacement other than a capital ship or aircraft carrier shall be acquired or constructed by, for or within the jurisdiction of any of the contracting powers. Vessels not specifically built as fighting ships nor taken in time of peace under government control for fighting purposes, which are employed on fleet duties or as troop transports, or in some other way for the purpose of assisting in the prosecution of facilities otherwise than as fighting ships, shall not be within the limits of this article. Article 12. No vessel of war or any contracting powers hereafter laid down other than a capital ship shall carry a gun with a calibre in excess of 8 inches. 200 female millimetres. Article 13. Except as provided in Article 9, no ship uh, designated in the present treaty to be scrapped may be re re reconverted into a vessel of war. Article 14. No preparation shall be made in a merchant ships in time of peace for the installation of warlike armaments for the purpose of converting such ships into vessels of war, other than the necessary stiffening of decks for the mounting of guns not exceeding six inches caliber. Article 16. If the construction of any war or vessel of war for a non-contracting power is undertaken within the jurisdiction of any of the contracting powers, such a power shall promptly inform the other contracting powers of the date of the signing of the contract, the date of which the keel of the ship is laid, and shall also communicate to them the particulars relating to the ship prescribed in Chapter 2, Part 3, Section 1, B, 4, and 5. Article 17. In the event of a contracting power being engaged in war, such power shall not use as vessel of war any vessel of war which may be under construction with jurisdiction or any other power or which they have been and may have been constructed within its jurisdiction for another power and not delivered. Article 18. Each of the contracting powers undertakes not to dispose by gift sale or any other mode of transport of, uh, for, of any vessel of war in such a manner that such a vessel may become vessel of war in navy of any foreign power. Now, if you're sitting there going, Alex, I'm, I'm sure you said earlier that this treaty was very problematic for Japan, but this doesn't appear to affect Japan. No, this is all basically the Americans trying to skewer the British. And when I say the Americans trying to skewer the British, which is the nation who managed to support their own large maritime infrastructure, largely by building for other nations. That's Britain. 
or at least the largest arms exporter in the world. They keep these massive defense companies going because they're always exporting. Nations don't tend to like to have all the details of their ships broadcast to other countries. They tend to like to keep it, to an extent, discreet. Um, eight inches doesn't matter. There's no total tonnage limitation. However, Article 14, who tends to use some armed merchant cruisers? That would be the Royal Navy to supplement their cruiser numbers. Now, this has got through, under the express understanding, the British can build as many cruisers of ships as they like. Which means that, frankly, someone should have turned around and gone, I will build four county class a year, at the least. Possibly six. Make them as big and as powerful as possible. Build up a fleet of heavy cruisers. Wouldn't have quite kept the armor going that air, uh, that battleship construction could have done, but it could have kept things happening. But um, what on the armor merchant ships? Other than the necessary stiffening of decks for the mounting of guns, not exceeding six inch. Now, specifically means mentions guns and not exceeding six inch. If I had been the Royal Navy, this is the point at which I would have come with a twin six inch mounting, which I would have had four AMs out merchant ships, which would have probably weighed the same as a triple torpedo launcher, or maybe even more torpedo launcher. They didn't see their way around for that, but I do think the not having torpedoes on the armed merchant cruisers is the big problem for the Royal Navy. If you consider what they could have got up to in World War II if they'd had some torpedoes on them. And let's be honest, <laughs> they make Article 17, and the Royal Navy does exactly in World War II what it did in World War I. That's our ship. I mean, they their destroyers for the Turkish this time rather than battleships, but they just go, that's our ship. There's always the point that if war had um, kicked off in January 1939 on the Singtao incident, the odds are ARA La Argentina, that modified Arafusa with um, a Crown Colony class, sort of later Crown Colony class layouts, you know, three triple turrets, would have ended up being inducted into the Royal Navy. It would have been an interesting ship to have had. Can imagine it being given some sort of name, appropriate name from the uh, from Britain, and would probably end up becoming a lead ship in a squadron of Arafusers. So the four twin gun Arafusers signed uh, lined up with this uh, this triple gun Arafuser, going hello world, we're coming hunting for you. That would be an excellent A to K line to have. Anyway, Washington Treaty other ships. So, the individual limit is 10,000 tons standard, and the gun calibre is limited to 8 inch. That's all you have to worry about. And even that you can fudge. If you consider the British got 10,400 tons, and that's if you believe the British. Literally, this is all that could be agreed on. The RN's proposed ban on submarines didn't happen. The US's proposed using the capital ship ratio system. Didn't happen. Britain's proposed ratio of the RN, 450,000 tons. USA, 300,000 tons. Japan, 250,000 tons. Now, that's actually quite nice, because there are some sketches where they, they basically propose it's 150,000 tons per major ocean you have to maintain, maintain a force in. Britain going, we have to do the Atlantic, the Indian, and the Pacific. So we need 150,000 tons of escorts for each ocean. Plus, we have the Mediterranean and all sorts of other commitments. Whereas, USA, you only have the Atlantic and the Pacific. And Japan, you just have the Pacific. Yeah. No one wanted that. So, honestly, there was even chance that there would have been no actual qualitative or 
limit on other ships at all put through this treaty. This comes from someone's back pocket. I'm, uh, there are debates whether it was the British or the Americans or the British had it as an option and the American intelligence picked up on it and therefore started uh, pushed it to come out. Or the, the, There's all sorts of discussions about the exact details of how it came out to be. There is an accepted historical version, which is usually the British proposed it. But if you read some of the accounts, it seems the Americans might have been suggesting it and were going to suggest their own cruisers on the constructed time, the Omahas, as the basis. And the British already had this plan, but and then went, well, you know, we'd like to use the Hawkins, expecting that it would get shot down like everyone else did, and it became a cell phone. But we'll leave that to one side. There does seem to be... There is also an argument which maybe the British were actually pushing it through to stop a general cruiser race. Because they didn't, they would quite have to get into a cruiser race, but if they're all limited to 10,000 tons, then they basically put a cap on the unlikely costs. Hmm. Everything can work. But the British did actually presume that everyone would push up their suggestion of the tonnage limit to slightly more. So what was building had just entered service at the time, and what they, are they using as their comparisons? Well, there's the Hawkins class, the Omaha class, and then the Gara class. And I could have gone for other classes of Japanese cruisers, because they're the only ones with multiple classes of cruisers under construction, but I picked the Garas because they seemed appropriate. And we look at them. Displacement in full here for the Hawkins is 12,500 tons. The others are babies in comparison. The main armament, seven, seven and a half inch guns. The US Omaha class, 12, six inch guns. Eight in single and four in two twin turrets. And the Nagara class, seven, 140 millimeter guns. Not quite. Five and a half inch, roughly. Thirty-one knots, thirty-five knots, thirty-six knots. Six twenty-one inch torpedo tubes in two twin launchers and two submerged single launchers was Hawkins torpedo armament. The belt has armor. But it's a bit mm. Omaha class has in many ways thicker armor. And the Nagara class, virtually no armor. These are all quite light ships. Large light cruiser. Light cruiser. Let's be honest, light cruiser. This is what they're basing their cruiser on, or the cruiser descriptions on. The smaller ships they're bringing into service to provide the numbers because they've all got enough big ships. Or in the US Navy's case, don't really have enough big ships, but don't really know what they need the big ships for. They don't really... The US Navy's cruiser doctrine is interesting. <clears throat> so that's your cruisers. Another ship. Let's see how it's applied to fortifications. Article 19. The United States, the British Empire, and Japan agree that the status quo at the time of signing of the present treaty, with regard to fortification naval bases, shall be maintained in the respective territories of possession specified here under. 1. The insular positions which the United States now holds, or may hereafter acquire in the Pacific Ocean, except uh, those adjacent to the coast of the United States, Alaska and the Panama Canal Zone, not including the Aleutian Islands and B, the Hawaiian Islands. Hong Kong and the insular position, uh, possessions which the British Empire now holds, or may hereafter acquire in the Pacific Ocean, east of the meridian of 110 degrees east, longitude, except A, those adjacent to the coast of Canada, B, the Commonwealth of Australia and its territories, and C, New Zealand. 3. 
The following are the territories and possessions of Japan and Pacific Ocean, to wit, the Kuril Islands, the Bonken Islands, the Bonnet Islands, the Ami Oshimi, the Lukushu Islands, the Formosa and Pescadores, and any insular territories or possessions in the Pacific Ocean which Japan may hereafter acquire. The Mason status quo on the foregoing trip provisions implies that no new fortifications or naval bases shall be established in territories and possessions specified. That no measures shall be taken to increase the existing naval facilities for the repair and maintenance of naval forces, and that no increase shall be made in the coast defences of the territories and possessions above specified. The restriction, however, does not preclude any such, uh, such repair and placement of worn-out weapons and equipment as is customary in naval and military establishments in time of peace. Britain's allowed to strengthen its fortifications in the Indian Ocean. No problems. Mediterranean. Yeah. Atlantic. Who cares? Caribbean. Go ahead. Canada. Australia. New Zealand. Woohoo! America. Yeah. All its territories. Atlantic side. Doesn't matter. Wherever it has territory, it can do it. The only one who's really restricted by this is Japan. So, not only have they no longer got the ability to build up what they would consider the sufficient force, the 10 to 7 ratio, but they're not allowed to fortify the lands they do have so that they can feel secure in them, even without that. Talk about going for gold. Surely the easiest place to win, if you don't want to concede the 7 to 10 ratio, you want a 10 to 6 ratio, a 5 to 3 ratio. If you really want that ratio, a place to concede to allow that ratio would be to tie down their ability to manoeuvre by making them fortify and spend money on fortifications. Just remember, any money they spend on fortifications into the islands is a uh, sunk cost. It's money they can't spend on ships, it's money they can't spend on their army, it's money they can't spend on anything else. And you can always sail past them. There comes a point when you start to think, hang on, are there no people who are actually naval strategists? actually making decisions of what we're pushing for. Or, and I say that in terms of, you can be a naval officer, you can be a very experienced naval officer, you can still not be a strategist. You can be an admiral tactician, admiral tactician. You can be an excellent officer all around, but it, it's slightly different being a strategist Especially when you're thinking in terms of how we're going to win the next war and how we're going to fight in peacetime, than how we fight in winning the war we are. Because this is comes across as if you're fighting the war you are now. This comes like a cross, like a clause in the Treaty of Versailles for Germany. Again, need to remind you, Japan fought on the side of the winners of World War One, and yet, basically, this is telling them that yeah, your territories in the Pacific. You can't secure, and we can have more ships permanently. And that's roughly the line. You notice that Singapore is uh, to the west, well, to the to the west of that line. These are the territories. The mandate. And yeah, <clears throat> the British can't do much about their territories. The Japanese can't do anything about their territories. Apart from, can they? Let's go see. Aleutian Islands and the Hawaiian Islands. The U.S. can defend. The 
So, yeah, the major powers, not only have they stripped Japan of its navy, but they've also stripped it of its ability to build fortifications. Cute. So, how do we make this equitable? Well, the trouble comes that in this scenario with one from one thing. By definition, the treaty should be considered equitable. Nations can build what they build and they need below ten thousand tons. The problem is the ten thousand ton limit. Is that that's what being built is being built. If Churchill had not come down on the seven and a half inch gun of the light cruiser faction and instead punted for the 9.2 inch design, which is roughly 15 to 18,000 tons for the Hawkins class. But the treaty as written is equitable. It is. It is equitable. And fortifications, as I've already started to explain, there are issues. And I'll actually be restating those in a second. So how do we make this all equitable? How do we make this work? Hawkins class here, HMS Trobisher. This is what the iron was building, and let's be honest, it does look like a C class has been expanded. Perhaps a D class, but it is very much in that mold. It doesn't look that really modern. It doesn't. We would be... It's one of those interesting things. We'll get to the Omaha's in a second again, and the the Japanese, you have all these turrets appearing for big ships. Six inch turrets. And yet for cruisers, they're taking a time to implement. I do wonder sometimes what would have happened if this class had been built with six inch twin guns like they built, they, they put on the Enterprise. B class. If they had been built with five twin six inch turrets instead of the seven and a half inch guns. I wonder if that would have made them very different, if that would have made the policy and the ideas of those ships very different. It would have certainly had an impact on the treaty. But then there's also, if they built the larger version, the 9.2 inch guns, that would have had an impact on the treaty. It's, it's funny, really, to think that almost a war emergency cruiser is what defines cruiser construction for the next 20 years and is the benchmark for cruiser construction throughout World War II. And the reality is this was one of the least viable cruiser designs the British ever constructed. To this day, I'm still not quite sure why the debate for the seven and a half inch gun wins. It's the it's available is part of the argument I think, but also there's the reality is something going You're arguing for something which is Neither the gun, the gun's never going to deal with a large surface torpedo. That's why it's carrying two submerged torpedoes, one on each broad side, and two twin torpedo launchers. That's the reason it has those, so that it can use torpedoes to deal with the larger threat.
But it would have had to be bigger. If you'd had the twin six inch guns, even if you'd had the twin six inch gun turrets, and gone for five of those, it would have had to be bigger. The fact that she has the gun oh, weapons outfit she does. The seven, seven and a half inch guns. It gives her firepower. It gives her status. But it doesn't exactly make her necessarily the most viable of warships. Under the foregoing provisions implies that no new fortifications or naval base, a base is, shall be established in the territories possessions specified that no measures shall be taken to increase the existing naval facilities or the repair and maintenance of naval forces and that no increase shall be made in the coast defences of the territorial and possession, territories and possessions above specified. This restriction, however, does not preclude such repair and replacement of worn-out weapons and equipment as is customary in naval and military establishments in time of peace. The problem is that this means that for USA, the Pacific is one large moat. And they are pretty much half of a continent on the other side of it. For the UK, the Pacific is the other side of the world and doesn't really matter as they can reinforce and upgrade Singapore and other blocking positions. Japan? They have neither the ships nor the fortifications to build any defence in depth. It's like they've lost the war. And no one wants to fight them again. There is the USS Omaha. The US Navy was building. Honestly, I do sometimes look at the cruisers which come out into uh, at the end of World War One, and I'm looking at them and I'm going, no, I'm not expecting something which is a ready-made town-class cruiser from World War Two. I don't expect to be that, but. There's such a weird mishmash sometimes of pre-Dreadnought design, uh, design ideas for cruisers and Dreadnought era and World War I experience and technologies which are going to lead to form and shape the later cruisers, especially the 1930s cruisers, that they just look a mess in terms of their design. You know, you've got something which has these two twin turrets. And then has all these casemate guns in weird bulges. Cruisers and other ships, they have to be left as is. There's nothing. The trouble is, if you're using the precedent, and which is what I use to justify upgrading the tonnage for the capital ships, I cannot then destroy that precedent now. Do I think it should have been rounded up more? Yes. But I don't have the precedent to do so. <clears throat> Fortifications? I'm modified. The maintenance of the status quo under the foregoing provisions implies that no new fortifications on naval bases shall be established in the territories and possessions specified. Existing naval facilities may be modernized as appropriate as long as their total area does not increase and a full disclosure to other signatories in order to provide for the repair and maintenance of naval forces. Furthermore, any improvements made in defence of those existing facilities are limited in armaments to the equivalency with cruisers with a maximum calibre of 8 inches. So, why did I do that? Why is this more equitable? than the way it's originally written. Well, this means that you can shove in as many 8-inch guns as you like. It means it's not going to be battleship-proof. So you want to you want to destroy a place, you can still turn up with your battle battleships and win. So, reality, it's not... It's strong. It's not that strong. But, if you're Japan, you feel you can strengthen it, 
to a degree. You can put in 8-inch guns. You can modernize as appropriate. And you can do all the things you want to do to your shipyards. As long as the total area doesn't increase. Now I expect that to be fudged. I expect people to be building up, building down on all sorts of things. But, yeah, this allows you to feel secure without actually being secure. It allows you to think, well, no, enemy cruisers aren't going to get here. I've got 8-inch guns to defend me. My base is going to be super strong. I'm going to be amazing. So you feel secure. The only way the enemy's going to crack this island is if they bring their battle fleet. And you don't think you're worth a battle fleet. So, first raids, anything like that, initial operations, we'll be able to resist. And ultimately, that's the other need for a defense treaty act. This is coming about now, a lot of discussions about treaties, uh, mainly in relation to what's going on. This is being filmed, of course, in 2022, in May 2022, with the current Russia-Ukraine war. And what sort of treaty and establishment will be put in place at the end? Be careful of treaties which, win, which you decide are winning. Basically, if no one comes away from a treaty without griping, it's probably been too generous to one side or the other. Natori. Yeah, this is Natori. Now, she is... Well, she is, of course, a Nagara class. She's what the Japanese are building at this point. And you can see the line out and positioning of the guns. You've got three stern. You have two forward. And two wing side of the of the forward superstructure. Which will look pretty cool. Summary. Some people are just realizing that I'm using pretty much the same summary slide for every one of these videos. And that's because the same summary does work for pretty much every point. If we go back to the various versions which were discussed. What was Britain worried about? Submarines. They proposed a ban on submarines. It didn't happen. France and Italy didn't want it. America didn't want it. U.S. proposed the capital ship ratio system. Britain didn't want that. The British wanted a system where the ratio would allow the Britain a successive advantage. Mainly because Britain felt they needed more ships because of the area the British Empire especially covered. The USA didn't want it because they didn't want a navy second to none. Uh, second to, uh, they wanted a navy second to none. If you look at the Washington tree, at the applied to fortifications, this is it. How is that equitable? Yeah, I could see Britain and America being limited to an extent because their treaty, their positions could be considered offensive. Well, Britons especially, because they're the other side of the world. But America's? Well, yeah. You are telling Japan at the same point that they cannot have the ships they want, which you know they want from your own intelligence intercepts. And you're also telling them they can't have fortifications. And then you walk away going, we won! And the Japanese walking away going, we lost. 
And that's the problem. Some people do honestly walk away going, we lost. Not, we're annoyed, but we lost. They've been part of the winning team in World War One. Again, I'm emphasizing this point. And now they were feeling they'd lost. There were already issues with America. The fact that the Anglo-Japanese naval treaty would collapse, uh, the Anglo-Japanese alliance would collapse as part of this deal. And it's very visible the Americans are happy about that and push for that. And then you have this treaty. Is it a wonder the Japanese start to think the Americans are after them? You're restricting their access to ships, you're restricting their, their ability to fortify, you're stripping them of their alliances. That sounds pretty darn predatory, doesn't it? And I'm not saying the Americans are necessarily wrong. They're looking at Japan as an expansionist, a militaristic society, a dangerous power that they are afraid of, and America is afraid. As well as Japan. And that's the trouble. You have two nations who are equally being ruled by fear at this point. And this treaty makes it worse. Because neither side is able to really feel strong. Because the Americans know they give up their best ships. They give up their best ships to secure this treaty. Yeah, they win. But how much have they won? And is it going to be enough? Other ships and fortifications. It's a weird area for a naval treaty to go into, but not unusual. Other ships especially. Fortifications less so. You needed balance. You needed the thing. You needed... <sighs> of all treaties, you almost need someone in the room who's going to sit there and go... Whoop, you've won your point. I'm keeping score. But let's go back to something pragmatic here, because this isn't a game. This is not a zero-sum game. And that's the trouble. Well, the other class I could have considered for... The Japanese ships, the tenure class, tenure class. The Japanese do keep building cruisers, and that's the thing. The Japanese keep building these light cruisers, which are really large destroyers in some ways. They are very focused around their torpedoes. The Nagara class had eight to twenty-four inch torpedoes and four twin launchers. The Royal Navy and the US Navy were both looking at six 21 inch torpedo tubes. They're bigger and there are more of them. Torpedoes are already, at this point for Japan, being seen as a big weapon system and a critical weapon system for their surface ships as well as everything else. That's something to remember when we're considering later treaties and later issues. So what have we got coming up? Well, the Pensacola of course is on the 7th of June. I've already explained about the treaty list. On the 14th of June we have the introduction to US cruiser strategy from the 1920s and 30s. And on the 15th of June we have the Equitable London Treaties, overall Equitable Treaties. I might have switched them around a bit. Actually, I think that's slightly wrong. Ah, yes, that's the 13th of June is the Equitable London Treaties, and the 14th of, 15th of June is the Gassanai class. I don't know. Life is fun sometimes. 
Life is hard. But, I hope you'll be enjoying all those. And I hope you'll be having fun. And here's what we've got in terms of lives. The 2nd and 13th, there'll be lives, just on Canadian time, and depending on what's going on. Uh, 16th of June, live on the Ecuador Treaty Series, if wished, which is why I've moved the Ecuador, uh, the um, conclusion of the Ecuador Treaty Series, of the, of the <coughs> the conclusion of London Treaty, to when I have. And 18th of June, the action of the 18th of June, 1799, how to lose perfectly good frigates. And the long patrol for that might well come out on the 17th. I'm going to write it while I'm away and record it when I get home. But that's why I have spun it round, to give myself a little bit of time. So I have a live on a topic which I've done a lot of, but I won't have to do any real prep for, because I've already done all the prep and done all these videos on the 16th, which is the Thursday. And then on the 18th, I can have another live. And on the 19th, I can have a live, which will be brew ships. And the 18th of June is the action the 18th of June on how to lose perfectly good frigates. It was fun. Take care. Have fun. And I hope you've enjoyed this.